Hello, and welcome to the first proper episode of Ubuntu Basics. So in this episode, I'm going to be talking about some of the very basic uh, parts of using the Ubuntu operating system with its default Unity interface. First of all, logging in. In this case, it's very simple. I've created a user with the username test and the password password. You should never use the password password for any of your accounts. If you do, I pretty much guarantee that they'll get hacked at some point. In any case, I will key in my password and tap the enter key and as you can see it logs in quite rapidly on the left side here we have what's called the launcher and all these applications are the applications which we have shortcuts to but are not running as you can see they don't have any marker near them and are not lit up this software updater is running which is demonstrated by the small white triangle to the left side of it if I click on the software updater I can see that there is a software update available. Now, installing updates for Ubuntu is as simple as this. You simply open up the software updater when it prompts you, press install now, wait a few moments, the update will download and install itself. Generally, you won't even have to reboot, although occasionally you will. In this case, I won't do it simply for the sake of the video. So I will press remind me later, and it will do so. I've already done a brief overview of the included applications but there are many more than the ones that are already linked on the sidebar here. We have the Firefox web browser. If I launch this, you can see that it takes a moment to load from disk, and here we go. We have a standard Firefox web browser. I can key in a website, and it will open up the web page. Ubuntu allows you to install some websites, which makes them run faster and gives you quick access through a shortcut. Uh, if you go to a website that supports this, it will come up with a small prompt. You simply press install, and it will do so. If you don't want to install, you can decline the prompt. Also included is the entire LibreOffice suite, Writer, Calc, and Impress, as well as several others. Writer is the equivalent to Microsoft's popular Word software and is, in fact, compatible with Microsoft Word. Calc is similar to Microsoft's Excel. It is a spreadsheet editor. And Impress is similar to Microsoft PowerPoint. All applications in the LibreOffice suite are completely compatible with the equivalent Microsoft products. And while there are some extremely small issues with compatibility, you can be almost 100% sure that any Word document, Excel document, or PowerPoint document will work fine on Ubuntu. These applications, however, are not the main focus of these tutorials or, in fact, of the Linux operating system. Linux's most powerful feature is hidden away by default because most users don't want to see it. It's called the terminal. You can access the terminal by simply opening up the Unity Interfaces search box and typing term. You will see terminal, uxterm, and xterm. uxterm and xterm are old pieces of software that are being kept around basically just to enhance compatibility with older programs. What we want to use is the default terminal here. If we simply click on it once, we will get a command prompt, nice purple box with a single line of text. This line of text is what's called the prompt. It ends with a dollar sign and a blinking cursor telling us that it's time for us to type a command. The rest of this text tells us who we are, we are user test, what computer we're on, test virtual box since I'm virtualizing this computer in the virtual box software and what folder we're in. In this case, it shows a tilde rather than a proper folder name because we're in our home folder, and so much time is spent in the home folder that if the entire folder name which were shown every time that you tried to change a file in the home folder, it would be rather tedious. The terminal is not a graphical interface like most operating system components. Rather, it's a textual interface. So instead of issuing commands by clicking buttons, we simply type. For example, to see the contents of the current folder that I'm in, I could type ls. Typing ls and tapping enter gives me a list of all the folders, seen in blue, and files, seen in white, that are in the current directory. But what is that directory? Well, I can find out by typing pwd, which stands for print working directory, and hitting enter. Apparently, I am in slash home slash test. Now, unlike Windows, Ubuntu and other Linux systems do not have the drive convention of c colon slash whatever but rather have slash as the root and under that slash home slash user etc 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 this may take a little getting used to but it is significantly easier once you are used to it because in Linux everything is a file 
Devices, such as the hard drive or speakers, are a file. External, internet-connected resources are a file. And even the computer's random access memory and CPU are files. In fact, just to demonstrate this, I'm going to type cat slash dev, which is the device directory, slash urandom, which will print a long string of random data. What am I accessing? Certainly not a file. In fact, what this is, is the computer's built-in hardware random number generator. It's on the CPU, it's a physical piece of silicon, and yet in Linux I can access it as if it were a file. One of the other extremely useful things about the Linux command line is that it's scriptable. So for any command that you type, for example ls or pwd, you could put that in a file and run the file and the command would be run. In fact, let's create a script now. I'm going to type nano to open up my favorite tiny text editor. It's a very simple text interface. You type, it enters the text. You can save and load files and not much else, but that's all you need in the command line. For this script, we're just going to have it print out of a couple simple lines. So we'll type echo as the command, and as the command's arguments, the things that come after the command that tell it exactly what you want it to do, we'll type the phrase, hello world, and place it in quotes, and another line from my first bash script. What this will do is once we've saved it and made it executable, we can run it and it will print the words, hello world, from my first bash script because the echo command simply prints whatever its arguments were onto the screen. So we'll save this by pressing Control o and typing a file name, in this case hello.sh. .sh is the conventional file extension for shell scripts. As you can see, Nano has detected that we're writing a shell script because of the extension we saved it as, and has highlighted our commands and our arguments. Pressing Control x allows us to leave the editor. We can now type ls and see that hello.sh is in this folder. However, it should be green, meaning that it's executable, and it isn't. We have to make it executable ourselves. This is very simple. We simply type chmod plus x, meaning add executable bit, and the file name, hello.sh. Tapping Enter gives us no output, but if we hit ls again, we can see that the color has changed to green and hello.sh is now executable. To run this program, we type dot slash, meaning the current folder, and no space, hello.sh. There's no space there because dot slash is not a command, but rather is identifying that we should run the hello.sh that is in the current folder. We then hit enter, and we can see that the output is correct. The script has output hello world from my first bash script. As you can probably imagine, this is not very useful, but the kind of things that can be done with bash scripting are nearly infinite. In the next video, we'll take a look at some of the most useful commands in the Linux operating system, and I'll show you exactly how the file system works and where you can find the things that you need.